Recently, the USA section of the International College of Dennis decided to record visually not only the history of the college, but several leaders in our profession. Dr. Harold O. Westerdahl, Secretary General Emeritus of the college, was selected as the outstanding individual to be honored with the first videotape. This second tape presents the historical highlights of the college in a conversational interview with Dr. Franklin M. Kenward, Secretary General of the International College of Dennis. Interviewing Dr. Kenward will be Dr. William C. Hopkins, Chairman of the college's video committee. Now I want to take a few minutes with you and talk with you about the very beginning of our college, which we're both so very proud. First of all, I'd like to just say, how did the college really get started? A need for the college developed because of uh, the world situation. You have to go back in time to realize that before the turn of the century, there was little or no communication between uh, peoples, particularly on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, taking it back that far, in Budapest, Hungary, a young man was born to rather well-to-do parents. The father was a physician and the mother was a teacher. And the young man was Louis Adafi, and he was born in Budapest, Hungary. And just by reason of his birth, he spoke four languages. That's fantastic. And he went on to, uh, to learn, over a period of time, 14 different languages. He was quite a linguist. He could communicate with people because he knew languages. He even wrote uh, two dictionaries, two dental dictionaries, yeah. one of the first men in the world to do this. But he came to the United States, finished his education, and over a period of time, he was such a great communicator that he became president of over 40 different dental organizations. And he eventually wound up in California, and what he wanted to do, his personal ambition, was to become or to found a dental school. And in, he got permission to go to Japan. Kind of a missionary type thing, or? Well, he, he wasn't really a missionary no. uh, like Gordon Agnew was. Uh, strictly he was, an educator. He was strictly an okay. educator. Mm -hmm. And when he, he got to Japan, he, he got permission. You must remember the point in time again where the communication, the only thing that they could communicate with was the telegraph. There was little or no radio and no TV, so that books or word of mouth were the only two things that you could really communicate with someone. About what time in, this, in the 19th? Before the turn of the century. Before the turn of the century, yes. okay. And again, you must realize that the, they were warring provinces in Japan. Uh, the warlords were who were the boss of their own territory, and they had their own shogun and so forth. This particular one that gave him permission allowed him to stay there three years. And then he had become very well acquainted with a Dr. Okamura and several other Japanese individuals, and they asked him uh, for weekly meetings. And they finally came to him and said, we appreciate what you've done for us in teaching us but we think that you'd better leave because the warlord is going to kill you. That's a good reason. Well, he left and he went to the Philippines. And mm -hmm. when he was in the Philippines, a rather interesting thing happened. He became treasurer of the Philippine Dental Association. And it was while he was there that he was instrumental in founding the Army Dental Corps, which I think is a, a rather great achievement. Yeah. You know. When he left the Philippines and retired and went to California, he came by Japan. 
and all of his former students came to him and pleaded with him to start an organization where they could continue this man-on-man -man learning process. Mm -hmm. He was such a great teacher. He promised them, yes, I'll take care of it. Well, he went back to the States and six years passed and there was a meeting in Philadelphia. And at that meeting, these same dentists were there and they yeah. cornered him and they made him organize the International College of Dentists. So he sat down and he went to the FDI files. They had a list of everyone. Mm -hmm. And he picked out the very top men that he knew in all countries of the world. And that basically, after his asking, he started it. And we've, we became incorporated in about 1926. And there was a little bit of confusion with the incorporation because one was the USA section, which was incorporated first, and then the college, which was incorporated. So there's a confusion of dates between 1926 and 1928. However, the, the, the plaque that I have on the wall in the central office signed by Louis Adafi says July 1928. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some of the first members, but uh, I don't know whether you could pick out any of those names just right off the top of your head or not. Uh, no, I, okay. I really can't. Uh, uh, and of course, the basic purposes for uh, the formation of the college. Well, the FDI, you, you must realize, uh, has a great th deal to do with governments, uh, where, th where they take care of masses of people. And everyone can join the FDI. Uh, the International College of Dentists is really a highly selective organization. Mm -hmm. We seek quality, not quantity, so that uh, Adafi sought out the, the finest brains that he could find with the thought in mind that he could continue this cooperation between countries. So he and Dr. Okamura really were the founders of the International College of Dentists. And they continued this. And even though radio came in, and television came in, and now audiovisual, they still communicated on a personal basis with visitations back and forth between countries. And this eventually has happened that the, the growth is now international in scope. When did the uh, position of uh, Secretary General become uh, active or, or our first Secretary General? I believe a fellow named Tanner was the first mm -hmm. truly Secretary General. But we didn't really become a, a viable force until Elmer Best took over. Mm -hmm. And Elmer, of course, was the uh, head of many organizations at that time, and particularly the Pierre Fouchard Academy, along with the International College. And that wasn't considered a really an ideal relationship, not because there was anything wrong with either organization, but we felt that the aims of both of, of these organizations were different. Mm -hmm. So Elmer Best separated no, Elmer didn't, excuse me. Oh. Wester, no, Westy separated yeah. the, the two after Elmer Best after passed Elmer away. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, you know, we have our present uh, convocation ceremonies, which are probably some of the finest uh, ceremonies of their type that have been developed in our profession. Uh, how did the early induction go, or how did, the, how did the fellow first come in in the early beginnings of the USA section, let's say? Uh, they would have a luncheon meeting at one of the big conventions and ask the people to stand up who were being inducted. And at that time, there were maybe four or five at a time. Mm -hmm. And they would be in just street clothes. And uh, they were lucky if we had a, uh, one of our ICD keys, that, you know, we hang on the ribbon, uh, to present to them. And they never received their certificate uh, of induction. Uh, until maybe four or five months later. It was run rather loosely and eventually as, as we grew to about 200 we saw the reason for separating because we would talk to them and tell them all about the college. Well it's easy to talk to five people or 10 or 15 but it gets a little burdensome, burdensome when, when there is 200. Mm -hmm. 
So they decided to, to split the convocation and the banquet. So now we have a separate convocation, which we hold in the afternoon, and in the evening we hold the banquet. That has happened, uh, uh, what, in the last... 25 years. 25 yeah. years. Yes, I would say that. And you mentioned a while back in, our, in your dissertation that the college actually is looking for quality and not quantity. Not quantity. Uh, we do have a maximum, however, in our in our college, which was set that we try to abide. What, uh, well, what the, precipitated the, that? And, we, we use sort of a rule of thumb. Again, the word is quality, not quantity. And if, if you think of how many dentists that we have in the United States today, for example, that belong to the American Dental Association, I'm not sure what the figure is, but say it's between 160 and 180,000. We felt that perhaps 2.5 percent might be mm -hmm. a maximum figure that we would allow for for membership. Uh, we're we're very much interested in in getting the absolute best. And and if one state had more qualified individuals, then we would take them from one state. But with our membership evaluation, we are able to pinpoint just exactly how many men should be available or should be considered from each particular state. Well, we know, and you mentioned what the original purpose of the college was, was an exchange of information and professional information. Uh, over the years, has the purposes or premises or changed the college? Have the goals changed? Or have any additions been made? No, I don't think that the goals have changed a bit, except it, it seems to be concentrating now into what I like to call the motto of the college which is the, uh, to promote the exchange of knowledge. Uh, to elaborate on that a little bit, I would say that to foster the growth of knowledge right. and to promote its dissemination throughout the world. Right. That is, it seems to be the, the essence of all we're doing today. Everything, all of, most of our projects are designed to promote education to encourage it. And uh, I feel that that's as strong a goal as, as any organization could possibly have. Then after BEST, of course, we had uh, Westy Westerdahl that came in. And uh, how in the world did you ever get involved in the position that you're in because you're our Secretary General now? Well, we had a meeting in Miami, and I was asked by Art Mann, who was at that time with L.D. Pankey, the Pankey Mann team. Uh, Art Mann was the regent of District 5, and he was my sponsor in the college. He brought me into the college. Uh, he invited me to join with, with him as in his private practice. At that time, I preferred to go on my own, which I did. But Art called on me when we had a national meeting down there to perform a few things for him. And uh, when he left the, the regency, he, he had turned it over to Ralph McClung. And again, I, I knew Ralph then. And this developed that uh, Eventually, I was selected to be regent. Mm -hmm. And I was in about my fourth or no, about fifth year as a regent. And uh, we had devised a few things for the college, one of which was the, the journalism awards thing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps someone saw uh, uh, an, some trace of organizational ability. And you mean a small spark? Just maybe a little someplace. weedsy one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, Westy wanted to retire, and I'll never forget Woody Birthright came to me one day, and he started asking me all kinds of questions, and I couldn't figure out what he had in his mind. It just never occurred <laughs> to me. And then the first thing I know, Westy got me aside, and he told me he wanted me to be Secretary General. Would I take it? Well. 
it was a very tough decision because at the same time I was offered the editorship of the American Dental Association Journal mm -hmm. and I was also offered the deanship of a school and I talked it over with my wife and we decided that I would prefer the, the International College of Dentists. Couldn't have made a better decision. <laughs> well, I feel that way. <laughs> I've never regretted it. I've, uh, like Westy said previously, his 19 years were a love affair. And uh, I found it a nightmare my first two or three years, but things finally straightened out. And right now, I know exactly what he means when he says a love affair. Great. Mm -hmm.